Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christian Lehman Church. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, we're so excited that you again, once again, chose to, to spend this Sunday morning with us. It's a beautiful day out and I promise you go take a walk later. But right now is just the perfect opportunity to come together to worship um, the Lord as one family this morning. Uh, we are going to get started in just a moment, but as people are trickling on, uh, I just encourage you, let us know who you are. Uh, give a little shout out in the comments. Um, I just, I don't know, challenge you to just every single person that comes up, somebody greet them, somebody say hello, somebody welcome them. We just want everybody to know that they are welcome in this place this morning. Um, and if you're new or visiting, Welcome to the family. We love to connect with you, get to know you better. Um, don't be shy. I know in the season of virtual worship, it can be hard if you're new to get plugged into a community. So um, I, I promise you we're really, really friendly. Um, join our virtual social hall after service, email us, um, and, and we love to get you plugged in, get to know you a little bit better. So um, that's available to you. Um, but as we get started, I'm going to pray for us. Uh, we're going to start off with a time of musical worship. And musical worship is just simply one way for us to, um, one way for us to express our love and our gratitude and thanksgiving to the Lord. Um, a, an opportunity for us to sing back and declare these truths, um, remembering who our God is that we serve and, and who Jesus is all about. Um, and so the, the chords will be up there for you. So go ahead, take some time, grab an instrument. Uh, if you have one lying around or if not, join us in, in singing and in prayer. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray to start off this, this morning. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we... We come before you this morning uh, so excited and so ready and so humbled to be able to, to worship you and to um, say your name and to sing and shout and, and be joyful um, and to do that freely, God. We know that some other places in the world are not so lucky, Lord, but we thank you that we have the chance to gather this morning, um, that not even a pandemic will uh, keep us from that. Um, but God, this morning, I, I, I ask that um, you would just show us more of who you are. I, I pray, Lord, that as we worship, as we sing these things, um, that they would not just be words that we sing out of memory or uh, routine or habit, Lord, but I pray that the words that we sing, um, that they would change us. I pray that when we sing words like, there is no one like you, God, we would believe it. We would believe it with our whole hearts, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that um, I, I pray that throughout this whole service that we would just have a spirit of openness. Would you help us to open up our hearts and our minds and our ears and our eyes to just see what you have? Help us to lay down everything else at your feet and just let you speak. And help us to listen, God. And so we, we give you this time and this day. We pray and we ask that you would be, we, we hope that you'd be delighted in this worship, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. city you're the king of these people you're the lord of this nation you are you're the light in this darkness you're the hope to the hopeless you're the peace to the restless you are there is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. Greater things, greater things 
have yet to come and greater things still to be done in this city greater things have yet to come greater things still to be done here still to be done here you're the lord you're the Lord of creation, the creator of all things. You're the king above all kings. You are. You're the strength in the weakness. You're the love to the broken. You're the joy in the sadness. You are. This next song that we're going to sing um, is called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And it, it's, an, it's an old hymn um, that I love to sing, but I actually, I, I've never looked up the, the history or the, the story behind the song until this past week. And, and I won't go into uh, the whole thing today, and I encourage you to look it up because it's, it's truly amazing. Um, but this is a song that was birthed in a time of someone's life of, of, pain and struggle and tragedy and this man um, experienced just so much sadness and, and tragedy again and again and it just seemed like like it just kept going and there was a point in his life where um, his his mother was dying he had no way to get to her um, but he decided instead to put his thoughts and his feelings into a song into these verses and and he says um he says the lord and i wrote the song together and it's a song that that talks about grief and talks about trials and and being weak and heavy laden but also having hope because he's coming to god in prayer 
because he's laying all that at Jesus' feet. And, and he calls upon his friend, Jesus, who is not only friend, but also Lord and master and king. And, and I think as we're going through all of this in our world right now, and as we're learning as a church, talking about these difficult topics, um, I think it's, it's a song that we could really, really benefit from as, as we're singing this morning. Um, just remembering that there is hope and we can lay everything, we can take everything that we're feeling and, and come to the Lord in prayer and know that he is a God who, who loves and who listens. Um, so let's sing that together. Praise an endless 
Lord God, we know that there is no one like you. There is no one above you. That you are the God of, of this church. You are the God of this city, of this nation, of this whole world. You hold the whole world in your hands, God. You are hope to the hopeless. You are light in the darkness. There is no one that compares. No name that is higher. No name that is sweeter, more powerful, more mighty than yours. And we want your name to be made known. We want your name to be glorified, God. And Lord, in this time where we might be heavy hearted, we might be um, sad we might be going through things in our lives and we might be looking at the world and, and seeing no hope, God. I pray that in those times that we would remember that God, the God of our city. We remember the God of this world who is love to the broken and joy in the sadness and that there is hope in you, God. And so as we continue to learn and worship and wrestle this morning, remind us of who you are. Give us the strength um, to be gracious and compassionate, um, to be uh, slow to become angry, quick to listen and learn, Lord. Um, as we grapple with these difficult things, would you soften our hearts, fill us with your presence, help us to do what we can't do on our own. We love you, Lord. We, we, we pray that you would be magnified and glorified, and we give you the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Denny? Pass it on to you now. Good morning, CLC. Coming to you live from the set of High School Musical and to the um, grads of 2020, uh, congrats. Um, simply put, the mission statement here at Christian Lemon Church is to make disciples who love God, love people, and who serve the world. One way that we seek to do that is uh, through our church website, simply visit us at www.christianlayman.org forward slash contact. Whether this is your first time joining us or this is your hundredth time joining us, uh, we're so glad that you could be a part of our service this morning. We'd love to get to know you, love to plug in, and if you'd like to learn more about what our church is all about, definitely make sure to visit us here. And so um, in the season that we're in now, um, you know, even though we're not physically all together in one place, we'd love to get to see photos of you and your family joining us on Sunday mornings or any fun photos that you would like to share. Simply email them to lynn at christianlayman.org and we'll forward a little sunshine and a, and a couple smiles everyone's way. So you might be asking, Denny, why are you wearing your pajamas and this giant towel around your neck? Well, given the season that we're in, even though we might not physically be able to have graduation all together, um, nonetheless, it is a time for us to celebrate our basic youth graduations. And so this morning from the studios that brought you Retreat in the Woods and many others, um, the CLC Productions team has a, um, has a graduation video for all our high school grads and so if all our high school grads could, um, in spirit, join me in throwing their caps up, um, enjoy the video, and I'll see you guys all next week. And congrats to all those high school grad grads out there.
know you're going to go out in the world and just do great things, and we're really proud of you. So may God bless you and help you to find that special place that he has for you in this world. Bye. Oh, wow. Great job, team, for making that video possible. And once again, congrats to all the graduates. Well, good morning, CLC. It's Pastor Ben here. I am so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning as we worship the Lord together and in spirit and in truth. And for those who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you to our family. You know, this morning... I, I want to begin by um, telling you a story that may reflect our attitudes toward the government. Here was a story. There was a young boy who, who wanted $100 so bad that he began to pray for two weeks to God, but nothing happened. So he decided to write a letter to God requesting that $100. When the post authority saw the boy's letter addressed to God, they decided to send that letter to the President of the United States. And the letter, the letter reached the White House, where the President was so amused that he instructed his secretary to send that little boy, but only $50, thinking that $100 was a bit too much for a young boy, but making sure that the letter looked like it came from God. After, um, after all, the, the President didn't want the boy to lose his faith. So a few days later, upon receiving the letter, the little boy was so delighted that he immediately wrote a thank you note to God that read, Dear God, thank you so very much for sending me the money. However, I've noticed that for some reason, you had to send it through Washington, D.C. And as usual, those lousy politicians took half of my money, you know. Uh, for the past few months, uh, we saw our nation go through destructions of communities, uh, personal properties, assault, battery, and even murder that many people to took to the streets demanding and emphasizing their rights. And as a result, the heart of distrust, anger, and other volatile emotions has set in the hearts of many as to how we may view our government. You know, I often hear people ask, so which form of the government is the best? Which is the one that God wants us to have? Is it a monarchy, an oligarchy, or is it a republic or a democracy? You know, even though the scriptures reflect various forms of governments, but the answer is not necessarily any of these, but rather what God has brought into being. What God has brought us, uh, brought into being. And surely, God has brought forth a form of a government. And today's message will illustrate our balancing responsibilities as believers with God and in state. So the theme uh, to first section of Romans 13 
is the relationship of the Christian to the state or, or to its government. You see, it outlines our responsibility to civil authorities, which some people have difficulty in doing. You know, growing up, you probably have heard of this maxim, never to discuss religion and politics in polite company or in public. And maybe that's why these seven verses have caused us more unhappiness and misery in the Christian circle than any other seven verses in the New Testament. Now, that could be an overstatement, but the issue of how we Christians operate in a secular environment, especially in terms of the government and the government authorities, now, it really can be challenging. And so my intention today is not to make you unhappy or more miserable or even cause a division, but to remind us what, what Romans chapter 12, verse 2 compels us to do, to renew our minds. You know, um, I find that those who are not Christians have a great difficulty in thinking of the government leaders, especially those who are tyrants, vicious, or cruels, as in any sense being a servant of God. And yet, if we Christians are going to conform our thinkings to reality, you know, i.e. proof as God sees it, this is what we must begin to think. We need to have our minds renewed to what the scripture says and to think along those lines about life around us in order that we might be able to present our bodies available to God to use in whatever situation that we find ourselves. So now with that being said, would you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 13, one through seven, as I try to address a topic, I really believe it's one of those very, very sensitive in nature, the Christian and our government. And this is what the Lord of the Lord, or what of the Lord says, let every soul be subject to the government authority, governing authorities, for there is no authority except from heaven, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring a judgment on themselves. For rulers are not terrors to good works, but to evil. Do you, want to be, do you want to be unafraid of the authorities and do what is good? And you will have praises from the same, for he is God's ministers to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of the wrath, but also for the conscientious for the conscience sake, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their taxes, all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honors. Now, I want you to first, or I'm going to illustrate the first element that I would like to point out and that is the our role to the government. Uh, what is our role? Well, it is summed up in that one verse, in verse one. And it is this word subject. It says, let every soul, and I think that includes you and I, since we are all a living creature. So let every soul, including yours and mine, be subject to the governing authorities. You know, right off the bat, automatically, some of you might have a problem with that. And maybe some are even thinking, well, and that's what it says, but it really doesn't mean that. Now, if some of you are thinking like that, I want you to take a look at verse 5, because Paul says it again. Therefore, you must be subject. Now, this word subject is an imperative. It is a command. And you know, Peter even takes this same word and he translates it into 
to submit. If you like, take a look in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, this is what Peter said. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human situation, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. Do you know that this Greek word, hupotasso, comes from two words, hupo meaning under, and tasso meaning to line up, to line up under. And did you know that it was used as a military uh, sense to arrange troops in formation under a leader? But did you know that when it was used as a non-military sense, it, it means a voluntary attitude of corporations, or it is also, or it can be translated also to help carry a burden. Well, I, I get the definition, but you know what, Pastor Ben, it's very, very unsettling and even nerve wracking to voluntarily muscle up the attitude of corporations or let alone even to help carry a burden for a government or government officials when they're becoming or they are tyrants. I mean, what do we do as Christians when the government goes against God's principles? Now, this is a great question. But I want you to hold on to this thought because I'm going to come back in the end and I'll try to elaborate. But for now, the basic role for a Christian to the government is to do what? To be a subject. You see, God is honored when his earthly representatives are seen as stabilizers in a society rather than being a rebel. And a good Christian is a good citizen. Now, with that being said, let me move on to the second element, which is the rule of the government. And here, let's see how far reaching Paul says that this authority goes. Now, I want you to look at the verse one again, but the second sentence in that verse, for there is no authority except from whom? Yep, you guessed it. God. And all the authorities that exist are appointed by whom? By God. And therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Now, with that being said, I can see another difficult statement for us to swallow. But you know what? Let's see where Paul begins. And that thing we really know we need to realize that's where we need to begin. And that is with the sovereignty of God. So here's the point. You see, power has only one source, and that true source is from God. No matter how well or no matter how poorly that power is used, all power comes from God. And the one who understood this element very well was Jesus as he stood before the pilot. The very man who would demand his execution of him on the cross. And so Pilate and Jesus met. As Pilate questions him, but Jesus gives no answer. As if Jesus had nothing to say to the Pilate. So then Pilate says to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and I have the power to release you. Then Jesus answered. This is what he says. You have no power at all against me, Pilate, unless it has been given to you from where? From above. Did you see Jesus' answer? Pilate, the only reason you have the power is because my Father in heaven put you in power. John 19, verse 10 through 11. You know, this week, Pastor Calvin brought up a really good point, a very, very good argument as to this text and to this very, very verse. You see that this verse has been used to support slavery of unjust immigrations and other racial policies in the Christian circle. And true, though Paul, uh, Paul doesn't go into this side or explains it in this passage, but I want you to set in motion, or 
I want us to go down memory lane. Now, do you remember in elementary school reciting the pledges of allegiance? Now, I know for some, you have to go way, way back. But do you remember the part that goes, one nation? That's right, under God. And I think this is so biblical that this nation exists as a nation under God. And what this is saying, of course, is that this nation are to recognize that they have limited powers. And they are not only agents of God and not God. Yes, a government has the authority over what we do with our properties, like paying taxes or set rules for speeding, but our government has no authority over God says ought to be done or to command us not to do what God says should be done. And here's what I'm getting at. You see, there are limits of the government powers and government has no right to enslave people. Now, which by the way, is one of the most cruelest manifestation imaginable regarding abusive or abuse among human race, because we bear the images of God. And last week, Pastor Calvin mentioned that from the beginning, God created mankind to be special, unique, diverse. And we were the only of his creation where God said, you are so good. And so as believers, we have the rights to resist the oppressions and religious persecutions by nonviolent means, of course, when given the opportunity. But we are not to resist the legitimate functions of the government. Let me repeat, but we are not to resist the le legitimate functions of our government. Now, that comes to our third element, which is reason for the government. Why does it exist? What's the purpose of a government? Well, if you take a look at verse three to five, it gives us the answer for rulers, are not a terror to do good works, but to do evil. You want to be unafraid of the authority, do what is good. And you will have praises from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sore in vain. For he is God's ministers and avenger, and to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for the conscientious sake. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. By the way, that word sword has a specific reference to capital punishment. It is sort of an execution in his context and in his linguistic roots. For he is God's servant, minister, and avengers to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of the wrath, but also for the conscientious sake. Now, this is the reason for our government, you know, twofold reasons why Paul says that they exist. Paul says the government is to be God's servant on earth for two reasons. Number one, to protect, and number two, to punish. To protect the community and punish the criminals. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I don't have a problem with that until I come to that word that Paul gives us to describe the government officials. Now, he uses it three times. Do you see it? It's that very word servant or minister, diaconus, which where we get the word deacons from. Now, when was the last time you got pulled over by a police officer, rolled down your window and thought, hey, here comes a minister or servant of God. Hello, sir. <laughs> Hello, Reverend. Hello, Deacon. Not I, nor any of you, right? Well, the idea here is that the government is not only to provide for our defense and security, but also to provide a certain common services that we all need and to function as that of a deacon in the church, it's sort of helping us in our needs. So, out of this grows the function of government in providing like your mail services, utilities like waters and sewage, schools, relief agencies, 
and many other functions of a government. So there are all these proper functions, reasons of a government agencies. Did you get that? So far, so good. Now, for the last element, which is our response to the government. And here, Paul is saying, as he flashes out into two full responses in verse 6 and 7, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers. For because of this, this you pay taxes, and render therefore to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom who honors. Now, um, do you remember me telling you in the beginning to renew our minds or renew your minds? Well, I, I have a test then. I, I want you to think of the IRS, IRS, yes, as God's ministers or God's deacon for a moment. Uh, wait, wait, wait. What? Now, that's going too far, Pastor Ben. I know, I know, I know. But it's in the word. It's in the scripture. So uh, let's just go along with it. For they are God's minister attending continually to this very thing. And so he, he, here are the two full responses. Number one, government should be supported. That's where your taxes comes in. And by the way, before I got married, my dad gave me two wisdom on a happy life and a happy marriage. And this is what he said, son, number one, never mess with the IRS. And number two, your wife is always right. You know, I've been married for 25 years. So far, so good. So number one, government should be supported. Now, number two, government should be respected and honored. Honor to whom honor, fear to whom fear. Now, this brings up an issue, and I told you I'd get back. Is there ever a time for civil disobedience? In answering this question, I want you to take a notice of a word in verse 5. This is what it says. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for your, what? Conscious sake. It's this word conscience. The context is that God gave us a conscience. A conscientious recognition that government is God-given. So by submitting to authority, that gives us a clear conscience, generally, hopefully. But what about it when it doesn't? What about it when the government violates God's law? And we know that. And now we have a very, very uneasy conscience. And what if the government is violating a clear scriptural principles and our conscience is violated? It was Apostle Paul who says in Acts chapter 24, verse 16, I always live to have a clear conscience before God and man. So then what if the state passes a law or policies that opposes God's given laws? You know, in answering that question, I want you to remember in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, where the Jewish Sanhedrins were in power in Jerusalem, and they just passed a law saying, you cannot speak the name of Jesus publicly anymore in this city. So when Peter and John found out about this, this law, this edict, do you remember what they did? They went out and they preached the gospel more. And guess what? They got arrested. And those who are in leadership and power said to Peter and, uh, I don't know, uh, Peter and John, why are you doing this? Didn't we give you an order? But we gave you a command. It's the law. And I love the responses. I love when Peter and, and John answer them and says, we must obey God rather than men. You see, this is civil disobedience because to obey man would be to obey, disobey God. And they said, we rather offend you and take the consequences than to offend my living God. 
So is there ever a time when believers ob obligation to civil authority is negated? In, in answering this, I, I want to give you a short answer and a long answer. And the short answer is yes. And the longer answer or long answer is yes, but just don't break any things. Now, let me elaborate a little further. It is the Christian duty in a civil affairs, civic affairs, to hold powers to account when we see injustice done. And there is more than one way of doing that, of course, and participating in an organizing massive protest is one of those ways. I know last month, uh, when given the opportunity to protest, I, I went out to the streets of Berkeley holding up the sign that read Black Lives Matter. And Pastor Andrew comes and he asks me, hey, Pastor Ben, why? Why did you go down there and protest? And here's the rule or here's the principle. We submit to government up to the point when obeying the government means disobeying God. Did you get that? We submit to the government up to the point when obeying the government means disobeying God. When the government says, don't do this, and God says to do it, you do it, and you disobey the government. If the government says the opposite to violate a clear command of God, we must obey God. You know, as believers, we have a dual citizenship. We are citizens of the earth and its governing realm, very true, but we are also citizens of what? Where? Heaven. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 states that our citizenship is in heaven. Even though I have an earthly address and I live in this country, but we need to constantly remind ourselves that we have a heavenly address, a spiritual address, that I am in Jesus Christ, which means I have an eventual address and an allegiance to the kingdom of heaven. Now, before I conclude, I want us to scroll down to one more verse in the book of Romans. And that's that verse, Romans chapter 13, verse 8, where Paul says that we should pay whatever we owe. Then Paul kind of ships the subject back to love. And this is what he says. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. You see what Paul is saying here, love is the most basic Christian ethics. We will always need to love one another. It is an eternal obligation. Why? Because the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. In a way, the law is the primary goal and the love is a stepping stone toward that goal. But actually, more accurately, love is the goal. And the law provides guidance about how we are to love. So in closing today's message, I want to give you a very challenging application. You know, last Friday, I was invited to one of the home groups where we were discussing racial injustices and the model minority myth. And people were talking and each had their own differences, opinions, which is fine, but long as you don't break things. But I was very, 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 very edified. I, I saw God siding uh, when not naming who, he said, hey guys, um, I think we really need to pray for our government and also for our president. And then kind of that silence. So here is the challenging thought. You know, I think we need to be very, very careful how we speak about government authorities and political figures. Now, we may disagree with them, of course. I mean, it's, it's inevitable. I mean, you know what? The woman that God gave me for 25 years, and I still find it alarming that we can't agree on certain things. But... I am bound by scripture to pray for my wife and to love her as Christ loves the church. 
as also we are bound by scripture to honor and to pray for our government and its officials and even our presidents. You know, if, if the maxim that states never to discuss religion and politics in polite company or in public, if that is true, you know what? We are living in a world of hurt, I think. But in talking about politics, I hope and I pray that most of our words are talking to God and about them and that we should be in prayers for them as well. I think it was the Godfather who said, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. You know, I think this is so biblical. And that's exactly what Jesus did, didn't he? Throughout the, the, the sermon series, Who is Our Neighbor? You know, um, the Holy Spirit has been convicting my heart to forgive and to repent for all those that I've othered. You know, even Jesus puts it this way, as he said, Behold, I send you out as sheep among the midst of the wolves. And the reason that I'm sending you out into the den of danger is because I actually want you to love them so much that amongst the wolves, my hope and my prayer is that some of those wolves will become sheep. But I understand that this is where the interface comes in. And one of the struggles as believers is balancing the responsibility as believers with God and to the state, since we carry both the heavenly and earthly passports. So I want to leave with you what Paul instructs Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. I want you to kind of think about this throughout this week. And keep in mind again, who's in leadership or who's the king, who's the Caesar on the throne during Rome? It was Nero. And this is what he says. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Now, you could put Nero there or any other government officials' names that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all the godliness and with reverence. I, you know, I know that it's, it's very challenging, but once again, this is what the scripture says. And I really believe that to renew our minds means to go and to really, really be what God commands us to be. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words. Even though it's hard for us to digest sometimes, but would you allow our minds to be renewed? to what the scripture says and to think along those lines about the life around us in order that we might be able to present our lives as a living sacrifice available to you to be used in whatever situation that we find ourselves. Father God, we're so much in, in turmoil and volatile state of where we are in COVID-19 and all these racial and social injustices. Father God, I pray that even though that our feet are aligned or we are stepping on earthly realm, help us to always remind that we have or that we are citizens of heaven. Father God, thank you uh, for these uh, words today. And I pray, Father God, as we live this week, Help us to always remind us of how we could be a good neighbors to others. Father God, I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now back to you, Caitlin. Thank you, Pastor Ben, for, for tackling such a hard topic. Um, we're going to continue to respond and worship. And um, if you, if, if you, have things that God is stirring up inside of you, you want to talk to somebody, we have an amazing prayer team that would love to connect with you, love to process and pray with you. 
Um, and obviously, now that things are virtual, um, I, if you have prayer requests, you can go ahead and contact prayer at christianlayman.org and one of the prayer ministers will connect with you, give you a call and, and process with you. We also have the, the virtual social hall afterwards just to talk more about what was said in the message and um, just learning together as a family. And so I encourage you to, to join that if you, um, if you desire. Um, we're going to continue worshiping with one more song. And I think as I was listening to this, um, the one thing that I was just thinking was like, wow, this that's hard. <laughs> um, it's really hard to do. And it, I, I'm going through my own kind of wrestling inside. But I think in the middle of that, God is just reminding me, you know what? I know it's hard, but I'm with you. And, and I encourage you just to turn your eyes to me, just to look at me. Um, I will give you the strength to do the things you don't think you can do, to pray for the people you don't think you can pray for. I will give you that strength. Just just keep your eyes focused on me. And so we're going to sing this song. It's, it's kind of a take on Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange, be dim in the light of his glory and grace.
more time. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Amen. Today's benediction comes from 2 Corinthians. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for joining us once again um, this Sunday. Uh, before I forget, there are a few announcements that I want to highlight. Again, if you do want to receive prayer, we do have an awesome prayer team um, who's available all week, really. They'd love to give you a call. So if you have a prayer request, uh, email prayer at christianlayman.org or reach out to Pam Tong for more information. Um, and also, if you have tithes or offerings and you want to support some of the ministries that you see here at CLC, um, feel free to go onto our website um, under the Give tab and, and go ahead and make your gift um, there. And one last thing, we have a virtual social hall right after service. Um, the information is up right now and there's a link for easy, more easy access in the comments. So um, feel free to click on that. Just if, if you can't stay the whole time, just swing by, say hello. We miss seeing all of your beautiful faces every week. Um, but once again, thanks for joining. Uh, we'll see you back same place, same time next Sunday. Have a good week.